Hi, it's Ramsey Dewey at the JX Fight Club in Shanghai, China. Well, upstairs in the conference room from the JX Fight Club anyway. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the Coach. Today we have a question from our friend John, who has a three-part question. He says, How would human evolution affect the world of professional fighting? Every year people are running faster, lifting more, and jumping higher. Will humans continue to push beyond our limits? In the distant future, will MMA fighters be superhuman by today's standards? Alternatively, do you think technology will take over? Will modern fighters be genetically enhanced or enhanced with bionics, exoskeletons, etc.? How would any of these changes affect MMA? Okay. Thanks for the question, John. Well, the question's plural. Now, that's an interesting one. The very first part of that, where you say every year people are running faster, lifting more, and jumping higher. Now, a lot of people take that for granted, because if you compare the records of runners, like, say, Usain Bolt, his sprinting records with, with people who were sprinting way back when, decades ago, his times are much faster significantly faster, and that's a sport where fractions of a second determine whether or not you win. But man, I've read some interesting studies about that stuff recently. Unfortunately, no internet access up here, so I'm, I'm not going to link them. Well, maybe I will. Maybe I'll look them up later. Maybe not. Probably not, because I'm a busy dude. Anyway, I read these studies. Comparing and contrasting modern athletes with athletes from decades ago. Trying to find out whether or not humans really are getting faster and stronger. And the conclusion was, no, not really. What? You might say, but Usain Bolt is way faster than that guy from 60 years ago or a hundred years ago, or whenever. What they concluded was that the technology, the equipment specifically, that runners use now, allow them to move much more quickly than their predecessors. For example, way back when, runners were not running on tracks that were all rubberized and nice and kind of bouncy. They were running on cinders. And when I was a kid, our school had a track for track and field events, and it was paved with cinders. And I remember getting really fatigued running on that. And when I read the study, I was like, whoa, that makes sense. But then look at the shoes. What are modern runners wearing on their feet? They're wearing space age technology, super light, ergonomically correct in every way. Space Age fabrics. What did they have way back when? They had shoes made out of leather. Heavy, not ergonomically correct. So the equipment is better. Now, they ran some tests between Usain Bolt and whoever held the same title a hundred years ago. And did some, I, I don't know how they did it, math, I guess. Math and computer simulations to try to figure out how fast Usain Bolt would have run on cinders in those old-timey leather shoes, compared with how fast the dude from a hundred years ago would have run on the rubberized track in the modern space-age sprinting shoes. And the difference was fractions of a second. Whoa, right? So is it the people that are evolving or is it our technology that's evolving and allowing us to express ourselves more dynamically? Not to say that people don't evolve. People don't change. I've read some fascinating, fascinating studies about that. You know, there's little animals, the, the water bear. Uh, what's, what's their technical name? These little pink gooey little things. I'm going to have to look up a picture of one and stick it up here. Um, and they've got eight little legs with little claw-looking things coming off of each one. 
and they've got a little suction cup mouth with teeth coming off it, and they're really gross and kind of frightening looking. They're sort of cute and disturbing and nightmarish all at the same time. Anyway, these little water bears, uh, these microscopic creatures, and uh, they've puzzled scientists for a long time because they're really, really hard to kill. They can survive without food or water or air for ever, basically. They just kind of dehydrate themselves into these little crystallized packets and wait until food and water and air and nutrients are available again, then they reinflate. And you can't kill them with heat, you can't kill them with cold, they can live in the vacuum of space. They are quite possibly the most resilient animal species on the planet. Well, some scientists went out and they they mapped the genome of the water bear and they found some really interesting things. They found out that about 20% of the, D D the DNA of the water bear actually came from other organisms. So what ended up happening, these creatures somehow managed to assimilate the DNA of other organisms, of viruses and retroviruses and bacteria and algae and fungus any type of DNA that essentially they found useful to their survival, they assimilate. And so over 20% of their own DNA is not even theirs. Weird, right? And man, that led to some interesting, interesting studies in other animals. These scientists thought, well, the water bear can do it. Maybe other animals can too. Cross species gene assimilation it's a weird science fictiony sounding thing but it's a real thing that's happening right now and guess what it also happens in humans but to a much much smaller degree much smaller so with the water bear it's like 20 percent of their dna with us it's more like a hundredth of a percent of one percent is not human but still that's weird to think about tiny, tiny part of you may not even be human. And what that part of your genetic code is that may have assimilated some other DNA from some other life forms, I don't know. Maybe it'll give you X-Men superpowers? Probably not. But isn't that interesting to think about? So this has opened up some really interesting uh, concepts and theories in the world of, of genetics and uh, and science and the, our whole idea about evolution has totally changed thanks to the water bear because previously it was thought I mean it was thought ever since um, ever since people figured out what genetics is actually even before then that we inherit traits from our parents if you have two parents with brown eyes there's a high chance you will have brown eyes too unless they both have a blue-eyed allele, in which case there is a problem, a possibility that you may have blue eyes. Now, I mean, we've, we've known that forever, but it was, it was assumed for the longest time in science that that was the only way that the DNA could be transferred, with the exception of mutation, which is supposedly very rare. But guess what? Guess what we found out? You don't even technically have to wait to evolve for the next generation. It happens within our own lifetime. Weird, right? Not nearly as fast as the water bear, but it still happens. Anyway, it's a fascinating thing, and I don't really know enough about that to give you the lowdown, just a simple synopsis of what I've read, but it's fascinating. So, in the distant future, you asked about that. Will MMA fighters be superhuman by today's standards? Well, you know what? Here's the weird thing about fighters. A well-trained fighter, compared to an average person, as far as hand-to-hand -hand combat goes, is like a Jedi Knight or a Sith Lord, if you're a Star Wars nerd, by comparison. 
Somebody who understands how to grapple, how to wrestle, how to box, understands jujitsu, understands kickboxing, knows their range perfectly. This kind of person is like an absolute Jedi space wizard compared to the average person in a hand-to-hand -hand altercation. So, here's the thing. Let's, MMA's only been around since, since when? Uh, early 90s? mid-90s, when the UFC started. I mean, technically there was Vale Tudo way back when in Brazil. I mean, there was Pancration back in the ancient Olympics in Greece. But as far as a modern combat sport, it's, it's only been around for like, not that long, man, not that long, just since the 90s. And if we compare modern fighters with the fighters back in the 90s from UFC 1, 2, 3, and so on, Pretty much everybody in the UFC now, remember Hoist Gracie when he won UFC 1 and everybody was like, wow, Hoist Gracie's the best, he's the best. Everybody in the UFC now would kick his butt. That version of him. So the fighters have evolved, they've changed. I mean, that's all that word means, it's gradual change over time. Gradual change over time, my friends. And if you are not evolving, if you're not gradually changing over time, well, at least in a positive direction, gradually change that. So, every year people are lifting more. I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I, I've looked at records for you know, the world's strongest man, uh, the biggest raw deadlift, things like that. And, and um, I don't have all the numbers off the top of my head, but um, the world records for, for raw deadlifting, it's always been somewhere in the, in the range of about a thousand pounds, give, give or take. I, I'm thinking a little less, but as far as raw deadlifting goes, I mean, that, that, it's been beaten, but we're talking like incremental amounts. Um, now, there are probably people out there on performance enhancing drugs or, or people using a deadlifting suit or some other special equipment who have lifted more. But as far as competition, the rules for raw deadlifting, it's, it's been about a thousand consistently. Hmm. But then again, mutants are among us. And every now and then somebody's born with an extra large, extra strong skeleton. And with that extra large, extra strong frame, you can grow some extra strong muscles and move some extra big weights. Do I think technology will take over? You know, I had a conversation while back with, uh, with my friend Jerry from the Fight Commentary Breakdowns about this. Um, and we were talking about the idea of robot training partners. And if we were able to, to make um, AI robot training partners that, that you could, that would react like a real person, but you could hit them and just beat them up as much as you wanted to, like an in, a more interactive sparring dummy, grappling dummy sort of thing. And you could program these things to respond in, in very specific ways and emulate certain fighting styles and, and have fail safe so they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't injure you. That would be game changing for the sport of mixed martial arts, for all combat sports, for all sports really. And if you could have realistic androids that you could just manhandle, why? Why is that? Well, as it is, the best method that I have found, and a lot of other coaches have found, to train their fighters to fight is to heavily regulate sparring. Because we have to hold back a lot when we spar. Why? So that we don't get hurt, so our training partners don't get hurt, because if we get injured, we have to recover before we can train again. And the less we train, the less we improve. 
But man, if we had robot sparring partners... Now, we wouldn't have to hold back so much. And we would get used to not holding back so much. Some fascinating statistics um, about warfare, modern warfare. So in old-timey warfare, people were just really, really bad at killing other people. Especially the infantry. You know, the people holding, holding the guns and, and uh, you know, trying to manually shoot people with a rifle. They were just really bad at it. The kill rate in, in armies worldwide was just very, very low. And if you look at the way they trained with rifles, what did they do back then? They had bullseye targets. You know, they were round and they tried to shoot the middle to improve their accuracy. And then some military leaders had this idea, this is not realistic, this is not conducive to what actually goes on on the battlefield. And so they gradually started making changes. One of the big changes was they changed the round bullseyes to human-shaped targets. And as soon as they changed the round bullseyes to human-shaped targets, what happened? The kill rate went up. Hmm. So this other guy had this idea, hey, what if we make the human-shaped targets more realistic? And so he went out and made some dummies, got cabbages and stuffed them with ketchup for the heads and put some clothes on, basically made these little scarecrows and had snipers practice shooting these things so they could see the heads explode with red stuff flying out to simulate killing an actual person, to make it look more real. What happened? The kill rate went up. And militaries have been experimenting with video games, first-person shooters, these sort of things that, um, that make killing more palatable. So what happens? The kill rate goes up. What does that have to do with fighting in MMA? Well, right now, because of the way we have to train for the safe of for, for the sake of safety. What happens? I think most fighters hold back to a certain extent. Even the good ones, even the really aggressive ones. We tend to get careful, really careful. Think about old-timey boxing. The old days of classic pugilism. Everybody keeps asking me in the comments, Ramsey, what do you think about classic pugilism? Pugilism, it's a fancy word for boxing, for using your fists to fight with. Well, back in olden times, before they, they wore gloves, or even the, in the early days of gloves, when they were just tight-fitting leather with very little or no padding on them to prevent the, hands, uh, the skin on the hands from breaking, the fighters were very careful with the way they punched. Now we don't have very much um, footage of those old bare knuckle boxing matches. It's, it's really hard to find those. But here on YouTube you can find um, some old fights, for example Jack Johnson's old fights, the early 1900s. And they wore small gloves, really small gloves. Very little padding, if any, on them. Sometimes just, sometimes just leather. And watch the way Jack Johnson fights. Watch how much he clinches up. Look at all the quote-unquote dirty boxing. Why is there so much wrestling going on? Why did all the fighters back then cross-train in wrestling? Boxers today don't cross-train in wrestling most of the time, but back then they did. Why? One, the clinch was allowed to continue. They didn't break it up right away. And two, it was an integral part of finding a carefully placed strike that wouldn't break your hand. So you wouldn't land it on the elbow or the head, something like that. So you watch those fighters in Jack Johnson's day, you see all of this hand fighting, all of this trapping, all of this grappling, all of this clinching. So what are they doing? They're trying to find these little windows, these little openings to land the carefully placed strike, the precision strike. And the thing is, 
audiences didn't really care for that, because it got boring after a while, especially if you had a long fight and a lot of them on the same card. I just got a message. Sorry, I got distracted. What was I saying? Oh yeah, boring fights. I'm gonna silence this thing. So what did they do? They said, well, to make the fights more exciting, let's put some padding on those gloves. That way, they can punch more recklessly. They don't, ha they don't have to be so cautious. And it will entertain the fans more. So they put padding on the gloves. And the gloves became more and more like the boxing gloves we have today. They keep our hands nice and padded and safe so we can throw reckless, wild punches with all of our weight and all of our power behind it. And even if it clips the guy right on the forehead or right on the elbow, there's a very good chance it's not going to break your hand. And you can keep throwing punches over and over again that otherwise would have broken your hands multiple times with relative impunity. So the technology, the gloves, changed the sport a lot. So you asked a question, would technology change mixed martial arts? Well, if they change the rules, and that happened in boxing, a number of times, a lot of times, actually. The addition of gloves, the addition of padding on the gloves, just two examples. I actually heard just yesterday um, that the UFC is planning on changing their gloves. I, I don't know how, but they're, they're going to change the design somehow. I don't know if it's subtle or major, but supposedly they're, they're going to do it. Will that change the outcome of fights? Yeah, it absolutely will. To what degree? I don't know. Time will tell. It might be a really subtle change. It might be a radically big one. Now, in all the fight shows that I fought in, we, we used different types of gloves in every one. For example, man, martial combat down in Singapore, they wore um, Fairtex gloves. And Fairtex MMA gloves are they are pretty rigid, pretty stiff, and kind of hard. And um, with a glove like that, it... Uh, it feels really, really nice on your hand when you're punching somebody right in the jaw. Whereas if you have a much softer glove with more give to it, you know, if it's just a, a thin padded MMA glove, a four ounce one, you better make sure you have your hands taped up really, really well under there. On the flip side, with those, that Fairtex glove, it has a... Uh, a more rounded surface up here. Not not on the level of a, a hybrid sparring glove or something like that, but but rounded and uh, and again it's very stiff. And so attempting to do a gable grip doesn't work quite as well, and the hands tend to slip a little. But the S grip, yeah, that'll work. S grip is always gonna work in any type of MMA glove, even the big thick hybrid sparring gloves. On the other hand, um, if, if you're fighting in China, a lot of times you'll be fighting in some Chinese brand of glove. And man, they've got so, so many, so many types of Chinese gloves here. Some are really nice and some are terrible. Some are super thin and squishy and spongy and some are thick and, and dense. And it changes how you can grip your hands and it changes the the grappling techniques you can use, or the way that you can use grappling techniques, and also the way you can strike, and the efficacy of those strikes. So a lot of MMA gloves, it's this weird thing, a lot of them have a lot of padding on the back of the hand for some reason, and like no padding over the knuckles, which, it's a weird design flaw in my opinion. It's almost like, uh, like the designers thought, what's the most dangerous strike you can possibly do? Of course, the back fist. I mean, back fists can and do happen in MMA, but um, not nearly as much as punches with the front of the hand, with the knuckles. So it's always boggled my mind why so few brands of MMA gloves have, uh, have so little padding over the knuckles anyway. 
So yeah, technology changes the fighter. So will fighters be genetically enhanced? Well, considering how athletic commissions are about um, enhancing fighters right now with performance enhancing drugs, I'm guessing they'll probably say no to that. Will they add things like exoskeletons, bionics, etc.? Uh, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say no, and here's why. What is really exciting about combat sports, the thrill of it, is the idea of danger. It's the fact that somebody might die. It's the fact that somebody could get killed in there. And that's always a real possibility in a cage fight. And if you take that away by putting armor on people, by giving people extra special protections with technological advancements, it's not so thrilling anymore. That goes away. You ever see that movie Real Steel with, who was it, Hugh Jackman, I think? It was based in this dystopian future where all human boxers have been replaced with robots. So they have robot boxing matches and everybody's really excited about robot boxing. And I'm watching this movie scratching my head thinking, why is anybody excited about robot boxing? Now I know there are these robot fights, you can watch some of them on YouTube, where people build these cool little robots and they go out to a, a ring and they have a battle bot challenge where, where one robot tries to defeat the other. But, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of fun, but it's, it's not going to draw the types of crowds that people putting their actual lives on the line for your entertainment are going to draw. Why? Because there's no risk involved other than, oh man, this, this little robot that I put some time and effort into might get scratched up. Because that's not a risk people care about. That's not a risk people can relate to. People can relate to life and limb. And that's what fighters put on the line in the cage. And if you take that away, what is MMA? If you turn it into what? A video game? A game of Street Fighter? You might as well be playing Xbox. Or PlayStation or whatever brand you like. Back on the arcade with the joystick. People got really excited about Street Fighter when I was a kid, but... Uh, man. Not that excited. Because what was the risk? The risk was somebody comes in, puts in a quarter in the machine, and then beats you. Oh, you just lost your quarter. Oh, that's the risk when you're a kid playing Street Fighter in the arcade. But you get in a cage, and you get beaten up for real. Man, there's a much, much greater risk than that. And that's what people tune in for. That's the excitement. That's the show. And you might say, well, I appreciate the techniques. Well, of course you do. But that's not all, because if all you appreciated was technique, I mean, you, you might as well be watching rhythmic gymnastics. There's tons of technique there. But it's not the same thing. Hey, gymnastics is cool. I like to watch it. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying they don't put their lives at risk doing flips and stuff. That stuff is potentially dangerous. But nobody's out there on the mat actively trying to kill them. <laughs> Let's see. I think there was another part to that question. Will humans continue to push beyond our limits? Yes. No matter what, no matter what, no matter how many naysayers there are out there who say, no, this is impossible. We'll never get that far. We'll never do it. The stubborn few will persist. 
and the stubborn few, the persistent, will see certain levels of success, and their successors will see certain levels of success, and their successors will see the next level. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train.